Welcome to Gospel Revolution Church. Welcome to everybody watching online. Thanks for coming. Thanks for being here. It's awesome to sit with you, to see your faces. It's awesome to know that you guys are tuning in from all over the world and just uh, sitting with me as we sit and, and feed on the bread of life and, and hear uh, from the, the word of Christos or the word that is Christ or the faith that is Christ. So glory to God. Hallelujah. We'll just, uh, we'll pray real quick. Thank you, Father, um, that you are the rock and that you manifested yourself in our midst through the person of Jesus. I just thank you, Lord, that uh, you come to reason with us and you come to sit with us and you come to speak life to us and you come to reveal yourself to us so that we can have all of our thoughts about you born from what we see in Jesus instead of what we see in the world. Thank you, Father, that uh, you've uh, done something to, to catch our sight up um, and to put our gaze upon you and that... Uh, you bring forth your life in us. Amen. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. You know, I, I was talking with a guy one day, and he was like, uh, everything's already finished. And I was like, amen. But what good is it if it's finished and I'm not experiencing it? <laughs> right? What good is it to me if it's finished and I'm not experiencing what's finished? So let us not take the truth that it is finished and let it let us not let ourselves be convinced that there's nothing to inquire of because it's finished right we we want to live our lives talking with god about what it is that he's done that's not a work it's called hanging out with each other right and you hang out with god and you talk with god about what he said and done in jesus that's not a work it's not laborious it's not laborious for me to hang out with brother jim or brother keith here it's a beautiful thing right they can share their heart with me that I can share my heart with them. And between the two of us, man, we can uh, just have a wonderful time. And so you want to look at, look at it that way with God, right? The last thing you want to do is let the truth that it is finished convince you that, um, that you don't have any type of uh, interaction with God because it's finished, right? I, I remember I was talking with one guy and he said, you, you don't have the carnal mind no more. I said, well, what good is it I don't have the carnal mind if everything I think is still born from the carnal mind? So, hallelujah, that I don't have the carnal mind. Hallelujah, that God had come and give me the mind of Christ. But what good is the mind of Christ to me if everything I think about is still born from the carnal mind instead of the mind of Christ? So, rather, yeah, glory to God that we have the mind of Christ. But let us talk about what is in the mind of Christ. <laughs> so that we can begin to find ourselves thinking like Christ thinks. And let us not confuse talking about the mind of Christ and what it is Christ thinks with doing a work or laboring to get something that we already have. But let us see that it's just a natural function of coming to know God and coming to know yourself the way that you've always been known by God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Um, thank you, Jesus. Last week, um, the name of the message is Living by Faith, and last week we, um, we're going to continue building on what we did last week. Last week, what we did is we built our understanding about great faith and what it is to have great faith on the foundation that is Christ, right? Because we, we had our, our understanding about great faith and what it is to have great faith on a different kind of a foundation. It wasn't built on the foundation that is Christ, right? And the Apostle Paul, I think it's 2 Corinthians 5, it, he, he come... And, and said in 2 Corinthians 5 that all of our doctrine should be built on the foundation that is Christ. All of our doctrine should be built on the foundation that is Christ. All of our doctrine about everything in the church should be built on the foundation that was revealed in Christ. And if I'm being honest, one of the, the things that hurts the church repetitively over and over and over and over and over again is we continue to come with the private interpretation of the scriptures, not seeing that everything we see in the scriptures are supposed to be built on the foundation that is Christ, right? Like we read verses in the Old Testament that talk in, in Proverbs that talk about the people rejoice when the righteous is reigning. And we come with the private interpretation and we turn that into the people rejoice if we can have the right president or the right world leader. But that's not building that doctrine on the foundation that is Christ. The scriptures call Jesus the just one. And so when it, the scriptures talk about the people rejoice when the righteous reigns, 
Listen, man, the righteous one, the just one, he is reigning. I don't know. He, if you know, he's seated at the right hand of God. And he's made every principality. He's ascended above every principality and every power. He's above every system of this world. And so rather, we're not looking to get the right world leader so we can rejoice. We're looking to see that Jesus, the just one, is reigning. And as our hearts begin to see that Jesus, the just one, is reigning, we'll find ourselves rejoicing. Hallelujah. And that's just one example where we come with the private interpretation concerning the scriptures and we build all these doctrines that aren't built on the foundation that was Jesus. And the result of that is we end up laboring for the meat that perishes instead of laboring for the meat that doesn't perish, right? So Paul come in in 2 Corinthians 5 and he said all of our doctrine should be built on the foundation that is Christ. Well, something that's happened, guys, with faith is that we've built our understanding, much of our understanding about faith has been built on wood, hay, and stubble. Much of our understanding about faith has been built on wood, hay, and stubble, right? It hasn't been built on Christ. So last week, we started building uh, our belief about faith on the foundation that is Christ. Today, what we're going to do is we're going to continue to build our belief about faith on the foundation that is Christ. And we're going to look at 2 Corinthians, I think it's chapter 3, um, or no, 2 Corinthians, I think it's chapter 5. Um, I might have the chapter wrong, but whatever chapter it is, the verse we're going to build on is, for we walk by faith and not by sight. And we're going to take that verse and we're going to continue to build our understanding about that verse on Christ so we can get a good idea of what it's saying. Now, as we said last week, To live by faith, which is what it means to walk by faith, to live by faith is to live by the knowledge of God. It means to live by the knowledge of God. It's for the life that you live in this world. It's for you to live the life you have in this world beholding Jesus. It's for you to live the life you have in this world beholding the faith that was revealed in his death and in his resurrection. That's what it means to walk by faith. The Apostle Paul come and told the Galatian church that when he saw that he was crucified with Christ, he no longer beheld his life in the world and the good he could see happen in the world, but instead he beheld his life in Jesus. He started to behold his life in the faith that was revealed in Jesus. He started to behold his life in the faith of the Son of God, which is the faith that was revealed in the death and the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus. And he says, as he walked in this world, beholding himself in his life, in Jesus, he found that it animated him with the very life of Christ, he'd come and say. And that's when he would say, it's no longer I that live, it's Christ that's living in me. The life that's manifesting inside of me is no longer the life that I built by my own strength. It's no longer the life that I can gain from the world, but the life that is animating my very being is the life of Christ. Hallelujah. That's what happens if you walk in this world beholding your life in his life. Right? Hallelujah. And so that's what the Apostle Paul is talking about there. He's talking about beholding his life in Jesus. He's talking about living in the world, beholding Jesus as he walks in the world. Glory to God. When he he comes and talks about we live by faith and not by sight, he isn't saying that he lived in the world trying to get things to manifest by his ability to believe. He's not saying, well, if I can get my belief to work right, then I can get all these good things to manifest. That's not what he's talking about when he talks about living by faith and not by sight. He isn't saying, well, I was all the time using my belief to get good things to manifest. And that's what it means to live by faith. Living by faith is not about setting your eyes on something you can get from the world and then spending all your days believing it will come to pass. (laughs) That ain't living by faith. That's actually living by sight. Living by faith isn't about trying to get things to manifest by believing that they'll happen. That's not what it means to live by faith. That's not living by faith at all. It's not about, well, I desire a certain house, or I desire a certain car, or I desire a certain job. It's not about, well, I desire a certain president, or I desire a certain government, and now I spend all my days believing that'll happen. That's not living by faith. 
That's not what it means to live by faith. That's not what the Apostle Paul was talking about when he talked about living by faith and not by sight. It actually has nothing to do with that. And if you look back to when the Apostle Paul was in prison, he wasn't living in prison, spending his days believing to get out of jail. That's not what he was doing. He wasn't living in prison thinking, it's not right for me to be here, and now I'll start believing every day that I'll get out so that it can come to pass. That's not what he was doing when he was in prison. That's not how he was living by faith or walking by faith when he was in prison. What Paul was doing while he was living in prison is Paul was believing that whether he got out of prison or not, nothing could separate him from the justice and liberty that God served him in the bodily resurrection of Jesus. Paul was living in prison, beholding his life in the face of Jesus, and he saw that whether he got out of prison or not, nothing could take his life from being held and hid in Christ. That's what he was living by. That's the faith that he had. As he was living in prison, his mind was filled with, I see the Son of Man, and I see my life in him. And I see the life that is in him can't be taken by being in prison. (laughs) He saw the justice and the liberty that he longed for in the man Jesus seated at the right hand of God. And that's what it meant, that he was living by faith. There's some hard things that we're going to say here, man. But I promise you, we built our doctrine or our understanding about faith on wood, hay, and stubble. And it needs to be burned up. It needs to be burned up so we can actually find ourselves walking by faith. The way we've been taught about faith is actually in the way of us experiencing the blessed life of just walking by faith. Believing on Jesus is not about believing that Jesus will make the world's systems right so you can have a righteous life through the world and its systems. That's not believing on Jesus. That's believing on the world. Listen, I thank God when he comes and tells me these things, right? Because I'm like, thank you, Lord, right? Because what we do is we get it right to be believing on the world for a righteous life, and we say Jesus will fix the world and its systems, and then we can have the righteous life we want from the world and its systems. (laughs) And we call that trusting Jesus. (laughs) Oh, man, you guys forgive me. And listen, this isn't to shame anyone if you're there. Like I said in the Bible study, I'm the chief of, of that kind of a sinner. No one done that more than me, right? I spent years doing that. And so let, let us not hear the voice of the serpent that tells us we ought to be ashamed if that's where we're at because that's not what it's about. You didn't come up with these doctrines, but it is about us putting these doctrines in the fire and letting our hearts be purified from them because they cometh not from above and they fill our hearts and our minds with laboring and, labors and annoyances. Believe, this, believing on Jesus is to believe the justice and the liberty and the righteous life that you long for is found in what God done to overcome sin and death in the bodily resurrection of Jesus. That's what it means to believe on Jesus. So if you find you want justice, it means you see the justice you long for in what God's done in Jesus. If you want liberty, you see the liberty that you long for is contained in what God's done in Jesus and raising him from the dead. If you want a righteous life, you see the righteous life that you want can only be served to you in what God has done in Jesus to overcome sin and death in the flesh. That's what believing on Jesus looks like. That's what it looks like to trust Jesus. Now don't, Don't hear what I'm not saying. Don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that we won't see life manifest as we walk in this world. I'm not saying that eternal life won't produce fruit in us as we walk in this world. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying those things can't happen. I'm not saying that we shouldn't commit our desire for life into the hands of God. I'm not saying we shouldn't talk with God about the things we desire for our life and then commit those desires into his hands. That's not what I'm saying. But what's what's happened is, is we've made the object of our faith corruptible things. The object of our faith has become corruptible things. The promises of God or the promise of God has been turned into corruptible things. We've made the object of of our faith the corruptible things that are in the world. That's what's happened. And so now we're no longer actually living by the faith. We're living by believing for things that are corruptible and thinking that those things that are corruptible can now give us the righteous life that we long for. Mm. 
You know, when Jesus performed miracles, the object of his faith wasn't the miracle itself. When Jesus performed miracles, the object of his faith was not that a miracle could happen. That wasn't the object of his faith when he performed miracles. When he performed miracles, the object of his faith was the life that he shares with the Father. Right? The foundation from where Jesus performed miracles was a deep persuasion in his heart that the life that he has in himself, that the life he shared with the Father from the beginning, that life overcomes sin in the flesh. And it even can send away the wages of sin from people. That was the object of Jesus' faith when he performed miracles. It was the life that he shared with the Father. He, the object of his faith wasn't that a miracle can happen. He was busy looking at the life he shared with the Father. And he saw something about the life that he shared with the Father. And he saw that this life even overcomes sin in the flesh. And this life even possesses the ability to send the wages of sin away from people. And so that was the object of his faith as he walked in the earth performing miracles. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Hebrews 11, verse 1. This is one of my favorite verses. All these verses are some of my favorite verses. I don't think so, man. But I think if you go back and look at my messages, you find me referring to these verses a lot. <laughs> uh, thank you, Jesus. Hebrews 11, verse 1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, as a young guy reading the scriptures, I got it right to say, my ability to believe is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I got it right to read my belief into that verse, where I would say, my belief, is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But that verse is not saying that your ability to believe is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Your belief didn't frame the worlds. Your belief didn't create all things. Your ability to believe is not what holds all things together. And so that verse is not talking about your belief or your ability to believe. That's not the point that that verse is trying to communicate. The Apostle Paul come and said that all things were created by the spirit of faith. That God created all things by the spirit of his faith. And then he would go on to say, and the Lord Jesus is that spirit. The Lord Jesus is the spirit of faith that created all things. The Lord Jesus is the spirit of faith that framed the world. The Lord Jesus is the spirit of faith that holds all things together. Not your belief and not your ability to believe. So we need to circumcise your heart from thinking that the word faith in that verse is talking about your belief. Although we will believe on this faith because guess what? It is the substance of everything we hope for and it's the evidence that we have what we've always hoped for. Now, hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so the, the word faith, faith in that verse, is talking about the doctrine of Christ that the Hebrews were introduced to through the oracles that God gave them by the hand of Moses that was brought to perfection and completion through the death, the resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus. That's what that word faith is talking about there. It's talking about the doctrine of Christ himself. When it says faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the doctrine that was revealed in Jesus. In his death, in his burial, in his resurrection, and in his ascension. That's what it's talking about there. Hebrews 12, if you read one chapter further. Hebrews 12, talking about the faith in Hebrews 11. Hebrews 12, talking about the faith in Hebrews 11, says this. Looking unto Jesus, the beginning and end of faith. Looking unto Jesus, the beginning and end of faith. So Jesus is the faith. He's the beginning and the end of the faith that Hebrews 11 is talking about. It's not talking about your belief. It's not talking about your ability to believe. It's not saying something like where if you can use your ability to believe, then that's going to be the power unto you having the things that you want from the world. That's not what it's talking about. 
That's not what it's saying. It's interesting how we get it right to read ourselves right into the text, right? In our current culture or society. Instead of thinking of what were these guys this letter was written to desiring for their life. Right? We don't, we need to, before we even understand what that verse is talking about and what the author is even saying, we need to understand what were those people that got the letter? What were they hoping for? What were they hoping for? And what did they want to come? And so if you take Hebrews 11, the verse in Hebrews 11, and you combine it with the verse in Hebrews 12, which is the point, because they're connected, it would sound something like this. Looking unto Jesus, the beginning and the end of the faith that is the substance of things hoped for. Looking unto Jesus, the beginning and the end of the faith that is the evidence of things not seen. I'm going to say it again for people that like to write this down or like to follow scripturally. When you combine those two verses, this is how it would sound, and it, it shapes the context so you can see clearly that faith being the substance is not talking about your belief being the substance. Looking unto Jesus, the beginning and the end of the faith that is the substance of things hoped for. Looking unto Jesus, the beginning and the end of the faith that is the evidence of things not seen. That's what he's saying there. Right? See how the whole point is for your sight and your heart to get focused on Jesus and not your own belief? Imagine that. It's about Jesus. That's, oh yeah, we build our doctrine on the foundation that is Christ, right? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Man, it's freezing in here, huh? Oh, it's hot? Leave it alone, babe. My poor wife. I, I didn't say turn it down. Oh, you did. I was like, I was like, did I say that? No, it is hot. There's no, there's, there's no in-between spot. It's hot or cold. Yeah, there's no in-between spot. It's just hot or cold. <laughs> Glory to God. I feel like when I was running and my hands would get cold, you know, and, and my feet would get cold. So the things hoped for in that verse, when it talks about the things hoped for, it's talking about a very specific thing. It's not talking about just the things that we can hope for. You're not supposed to read the things hoped for and then read yourself into the text and say, well, I hope for a car and I hope for a house and that's how this thing is going to go down. It's talking about a very specific thing. The things hoped for is talking about a very specific thing. You don't get to read what you think the things hoped for are into the text. It's already there. The text already declares what the things are that are hoped for. So it's not, well, um, I want a car, and if I can now believe, then my belief is the substance and the evidence that I will now have a car. That's not what it's saying. The things hoped for. It's not saying, well, I want a car, I hope I can have a car, and if I can now believe enough that I'm going to have a car, then that will be the substance and the evidence that I'm going to get a car. That's not what it's talking about there. But that's how we've read it into the text. It's not saying that. The things hoped for, remember it's the letter to the Hebrews. The things hoped for is talking about what the Hebrews wanted to see happen through the oracles God gave them by the hands of Moses. The Hebrews wanted to see something happen. They were looking at the law that they got by the hand of Moses from God and they were seeing certain things in that law and they were desiring those things. And what they were desiring was that sin would be removed from them. They were looking at that law and that they got from God by the hand of Moses and they were desiring to be cleansed from death. They were desiring to inherit eternal life. They were desiring the kingdom of God. That's what they were desiring. That's the things hoped for. These guys hoped for sin to be removed as far as the east is from the west. They hoped for the death that found an opportunity to manifest in their bodies to be cleansed from them. They were hoping to be set apart from death unto eternal life. That's what they were hoping for. And so the author of Hebrews is addressing that. The author of Hebrews is saying, well, guys, listen, Everything we were looking for from the law has been realized in Christ. All those things we were desiring from the law, it's been realized in Christ. We were wanting an incorruptible life. 
with a life that wasn't subject to the world or the decay and the tribulation in the world. That's what we were wanting. We were desiring to be cleansed from the death that found an opportunity to manifest in our bodies by the sin of one man, Adam. We were desiring for God to be with us, to be a father to us, to justify us, to defend us from the giant of death, to defend us from the persecution in the world. We were desiring that. And the author of Hebrews comes and says, all those things we were desiring, listen, man, within the faith that was revealed in Jesus is the substance of everything we've ever desired for our lives. This truth that is manifested in Jesus is actually testifying to us that God hath cleansed us from death once for all time. This truth that manifested in Jesus is testifying to us that God has set our lives apart from the earth and has set our lives apart unto him and his eternal life. The incorruptible life we long for, we've actually attained to it in this man, Jesus. That's what he's trying to tell these guys. All those things we were hoping for. Listen, man, they've all been realized in Jesus. So let us no longer look to the law or the works of the law or to the world, to try to get the things that we were hoping for, let us realize all the things we're hoping for are contained within this faith that was manifested in the man Jesus. And that applies for all of us. Guys, we're all sitting around desiring something. You may think you're desiring a car, or a house, or a spouse, or money, or a job. And listen, you, you might enjoy some of that stuff, right, as you walk in this world. But let me tell you what you're actually desiring. You're desiring an incorruptible life. You're desiring a life that can't be corroded or decayed by the world. You're desiring a life that's been cleansed from death once for all time, never to be able to be touched by death again. You're desiring to never feel weakness again. You're desiring to have a life that even overcomes the world. You're desiring a peace and a love and joy that doesn't come and go with the wind as it blows. That's what you're desiring. Listen, guys, within the faith that was made flesh in Jesus is the life you've always been desiring. The beautiful life you want the things you've always desired. Listen, man, it's contained within this faith that was manifested in Jesus. Hallelujah. That's what he's saying. The life that manifested in Jesus by the power of the Father's love for him is the substance of everything we've ever wanted. (laughs) What happens when you see the substance of everything, everything you've ever wanted in Jesus, guess where your heart goes? Guess what it starts looking at? Jesus. Guess what it stops looking at? The world. (laughs) Listen, I'm telling you, when that starts to go down inside of you, it becomes a tree of life to you. And you actually begin experiencing a life. And you think, but I didn't do anything to bring this life forth. Amen. (laughs) That's when you feel the most happy about it, right? When you didn't do anything to bring it forth. Thank you, Jesus. Right? Hallelujah. 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 That's what the author of Hebrews is trying to tell these guys. The substance of everything we've wanted. You know the lamb and the law? How the lamb talked about cleansing us from sin? And how it was going to make a way for us to come into the presence of God? And stand in the presence of God? And experience his life and become one with his life? You know how the law talked about all that? Man, the substance of all those things have actually been manifested in this man, Jesus That's the faith he's talking about. You can actually say it this way. Jesus is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That's the easiest way you would actually say it. Jesus is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. When you hear the verse that way, you don't even need to be told to walk by faith. Do you know what ends up happening? Is you just walk in this world beholding Jesus. Because you've been taught that the substance of everything you want is found in him. So you just naturally walk in this world looking at Jesus. Talking to God about the life you see in Jesus. Talking to God about what that looks like in your life. Walking and talking with God, man. It's a beautiful thing, glory to God. Hebrews 11 says this. It goes on to, we'll look at the second part of this. Hebrews 11 says, faith is the evidence of things not seen. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. And as we just said, the best way to put that in its proper context is to say Jesus is the evidence of things not seen. Jesus is the evidence of things not seen. 
It's not saying your belief is the evidence of things not seen. It's not saying that. It's not saying your ability to believe is the evidence of things not seen. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. We do believe on the faith that is the evidence of things not seen, right? But when when that verse says faith is the evidence of things not seen, it's not saying, well, I use the car analogy a lot. It's not saying, well, I want a car, and even though I don't see a car here, my belief that I will have one is the evidence it will come to pass. Listen, we chuckle now. I spent 10 years of my life thinking that. And there's a whole section of Christianity that is awash with that. And is teaching faith that way. And it's putting people's eyes squarely on their own ability instead of on Jesus. It's filling them with anxiety, fear, all those kinds of things. And so I'll, I'll put that verse, the evidence of things not seen. Right? When it says the faith is the evidence of things not seen, it's along the lines of what it says in 1 John, where it says, as Jesus is now, so are we in this world. He goes on to say, Beloved, it's not yet seen what we shall be. What's he saying there? We haven't seen our immortal bodies glorified with immortality yet. But the evidence that we have immortality is seen in Jesus because we see he's clothed in a glorified immortal body and he's the son of man. And he, he says, and we know that when he comes in glorified immortal flesh, we see, we'll see him and we'll see we're the same as him. That's the context there. Jesus is the evidence that you possess eternal life now, even though when you look at your body, you see a body that's still mortal. Jesus is the evidence that you possess an incorruptible life now, even though that when you look in the world around you, you see a world that's filled with corruption and decay. The faith that was revealed in the resurrection of Jesus is the evidence that now you possess an incorruptible life. Hallelujah. That's one of the most powerful things human beings that are believers need to be persuaded of. The life that they have. And what it means that they have this life in light of walking in a world that's still shadowed by death. That's actually all we need, is to be persuaded of the life that we have in God. We need to be pointed to Jesus so we can behold ourselves in the face of Jesus. And as we see ourselves in the face of Jesus, we say, well, Jesus is in the Father, and the Father is in Him. That means that we're in the Father, and the Father's in us. That means the Father's life is our life. We start living in the world by that, glory to God. Glory to God. So the question that you could ask yourself, or the question that would be posed, as I was just trying to highlight, how can we be sure that we've inherited the promised life? Right? Like, how can we be sure? Like, uh, I don't know, one of my friends six months ago passed away. (laughs) Right? And I had to do his funeral. And so I still see death in the world. I mean, I still see wars and rumors of wars and famines and all these different kinds of things. So how can I be sure that I've already inherited the promised life? How can we be sure that we've been cleansed from death and raised unto a life that could never be corrupted by sin or the world again? How can we be sure of that? Don't we need some type of evidence? To be sure of that? The faith we see in Jesus is the evidence. That's what this guy's trying to say. The faith we see in Jesus is the evidence. Looking to what we see in Jesus, we see the evidence that we've been sanctified from sin and death once for all time. How do we, how do we see the evidence of that? We look at Jesus and we see he was cleansed from the wound of death once for all time. Can Jesus die unto sin ever again? No. Can death come into Jesus' body ever again? No. Well, that's trying to testify something to us about the life we have. 
It's trying to tell us this is the evidence that even though you don't see immortality in your flesh yet, even though you're still walking in a valley shadowed by death, this is the evidence that you've already attained to the promised life. This is the evidence that you've already been sanctified from the wound of death once for all time, never to be able to die to the sin and death in the world ever again. The evidence is the glorified man, Christ Jesus. We see the Son of Man. Jesus is the evidence. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. (laughs) Uh, Just to, to pepper some of this language with the letter to the Hebrews. We see Jesus and we see our high priest. Right? The high priest performed things in the law, in the letter to the Hebrews. And these Hebrews would have been accustomed with the high priest doing things so sin could be removed. They would be accustomed to the high priest offering a lamb on the Day of Atonement so that he could go into the holiest place in the presence of God. And so he comes and says, all that work that the law spoke about, it actually spoke about the God-man, Christ Jesus. And so we see Jesus and we see our high priest. We see his ministry is after the order of Melchizedek and reigns through the power of an indestructible life. We see Jesus came in the likeness of sinful flesh. We see that he put our weakness, he took our weakness into himself. That we could be cleansed from death and that we could be set apart unto eternal life so that we could obtain or inherit the promised life in him. Looking unto Jesus, man, we see Jesus. We see he is the son of man. We see he's seated at the right hand of God. We see Jesus and we see our lives hid with God in him. That's the evidence that now we have life. Even though we live in a world shadowed by death all the time trying to come to us and say, do you really have what you need to have a righteous life? Do you? What about this? What about that? Look at these things. Looking unto Jesus. The beginning and the end of the faith that is the substance of the things we've hoped for. The evidence that now we have the things that we don't yet see. You've already inherited a glorified earth. Just because you don't see the earth glorified yet doesn't mean you haven't already inherited. The evidence is Jesus. <laughs> we see Jesus. And the life he has in himself testifies to us that everything we desire for our lives has come true in him. Everything you desire for your life has already come true in Jesus. Everything you desire for your life has already come true in Jesus. Everything else is just what you enjoy. It's not things to suck life out of. It's things you do from the foundation of, I already have all things that pertain to life and God likeness, and I like this. It gives me a buzz. It makes me happy. I'm not doing this to get a blessing. I'm not doing this to get life. Woe is me if that's why I'm doing this, and this thing will go away quick like it would have already died like five years ago if that's why I was doing it. Because I don't possess the strength to give this life. This is what I'm doing, seeing the evidence that I already have everything I want for life in Jesus. And now that that's a case closed, book closed, this is what I'm busy with. (laughs) Hallelujah, man. There's liberty for you to follow the passion in your heart. And the power unto you following the passion in your heart isn't you convincing yourself to follow the passion in your heart. It's in you seeing the substance of everything you desire for your life is found in Jesus. Glory to God. We see Jesus and we see the justice and the liberty that we know is right. And we see that it's already been served to us. Right? We walk by faith and not by sight. We don't look at the world to determine if we have the justice or liberty that we want and that we know is right, but rather we see that God served us with justice and liberty in the bodily resurrection of Jesus. And we live by beholding Jesus as the evidence that justice has been served. It's not a nice life if you're all the time living, looking for justice or looking for liberty. If every single thing that happens to you is from the realm of being able to take liberty from you, you're going to spend a lot of time fighting. You're going to spend a lot of time being very upset. If everything that you see going on in the world rises to the realm of being to take away or give justice, you're going to be a very tormented person. 
You're going to be taken captive by that. And you're going to get very upset every time the world does what it always do, which is perish and decay. Right? I just want to say it this way, guys, to say it as radically as I can. The world doesn't have justice to give. The world doesn't have freedom to give. It can't give you the things you hope for. The substance of the liberty and the justice that you long for is contained in what God's done in Jesus in his bodily resurrection. It's contained there. The world's all the time coming to us with look, what looks like justice and liberty and saying, look, look, if you could just grab a hold of that. But it isn't just if you can grab a hold of that, it's this is all in the way too, <laughs> right? If you can make that straight, then you can have it, right? This is how you live peacefully among people. You know how you live peacefully among people? You don't look at what they're doing as being able to give or take away your liberty. You know how you live peacefully amongst people in a perverse generation? You don't look at everything they're doing as if it can give or take away your righteous life. You see that I have a righteous life in Jesus, a life filled with peace and love and joy, and nothing in this world can take that life from me. Right? And you're thinking, well, what's the evidence of that, bro? Jesus, whoever liveth, who Paul said died unto sin once, never to be able to die again? Consider yourselves, Paul says, likewise, dead unto sin, never to be able to die again. What's the evidence? Jesus. <laughs> oh, man. We see the Son of Man. That's what Stephen was talking about. He was walking by faith and not by sight. In the books of Acts, what does Stephen say? I see the Son of Man. He wasn't living by sight. He was living by faith. He didn't live in the world beholding himself or his life in the world or what was happening to him in the world. That's not how Stephen was living. He was living beholding the resurrected Jesus. I see the Son of Man, he says. Do you know when he said that? Is when they picked up stones to take him out. And so he says, I see the Son of Man I see the resurrected Jesus seated at the right hand of God. He saw that Jesus was the Son of Man. He said, I'm the Son of Man. And he saw his life in Jesus right in that moment where they were going to try to snuff it out, where the world was going to try to snuff out his life. He saw the death that was in the world could not stand against him. He saw the Son of Man in the very glory and immortality of God. And in that moment, he saw everything he'd ever desired for his life in Jesus. When Stephen says, I see the Son of Man, you know what he's saying? I see the substance of everything I've longed for right there. And I see the evidence that even though you guys have circled me around and picked up stones to try and snuff out my life, I see the evidence that I have an incorruptible life that can't be snuffed out in the Son of Man, seated on the right hand of God. And I think it, the scripture says Jesus stand, is standing standing. Now you can read a bunch of things into that and I won't argue with anybody that wants to say anything as long as it's in line with the love of God, right? But it, it's like Jesus and the life that he has in himself stands up against the giant of death that's coming against Stephen. And Stephen says, I see. I see my David. I see my David and I see my advocate against this death that's standing up against me. And I see that he's already slayed this giant Uh, and then what happens from, what, 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 what fills Stephen when, when he sees that? He blesses those who were cursing him. He prays for those that were despitefully using him. He loves the people that were filled with hatred towards him. Not because he heard that was the good and the right thing. He wasn't trying to mimic Jesus. It's because he saw everything he desired for an incorruptible life in the face of Jesus, seated at the right hand of God. And he knew that his life was preserved already and not even the death in this world could snuff it out. Right? That's faith. If you look at Jesus, Jesus also walked by faith and not by sight. Didn't he? I mean, when Jesus went to the cross, what was he beholding there? Was he beholding his life in the world and what was happening to him in the world? 
Or was he beholding his life in the Father? You can see Hebrews 11 in Jesus nailed to the tree. Jesus saw the substance of everything he hoped for in the Father. He saw the life. He saw that his life was in the Father. And the Father's life was in him. He saw the life that he and the Father shared from the beginning when they made all things. And he saw the substance of everything he desired for his life. When Jesus was on the cross, he was desiring something. And he saw the substance of everything he desired when he was on the cross was found in the Father and the Father's love for him. And he saw that he was in the Father and the Father was in him. And he saw that that was the evidence that he had everything he longed for even though he saw his mortal body perishing on the cross. He walked by faith and not by sight. Again, guys, our definitions are so jacked up. Please try and hear what I'm saying. I'm not saying, we're not talking about Jesus' ability to believe. We're talking about what Jesus saw that produced a belief in him. That's what we're talking about. The gospel is about revealing to you the same thing Jesus saw when he walked the earth. Because it will produce the same life in you that it produced in Jesus. All that it wants you to do is look at it. Hear it. Listen to it. That's it. It will do the work. The word, what does the scripture, what does Isaiah say? That the word has gone forth in the earth and it will not return unto him void, but it will accomplish that which it was sent to do. The power unto the life of God is contained in His Word. It's contained in the faith that was revealed in the resurrection and ascension and the death of Jesus. And that Word has the strength within it to produce the life in you. And all that God's trying to do is to get you to sit down long enough to hear it. And for you to ask questions about it. And for you to... I don't know, God. That's that's a hard saying. You know how many times I told God that's a hard saying, bro? I don't... I don't understand that. And you know, that's actually the foundation from where God started bringing forth revelatory understanding inside of me. I remember the first time, and I say this a lot, so you guys bear with me, but I remember the first time I saw that Psalm 23 was talking about Jesus on the cross. And and it says, my cup runneth over. And I remember telling God, how did that guy say his cup runneth over when he was nailed to a tree? I remember telling God, that's a hard saying, Father. That don't make no sense to me. Because everything in my heart had been raised and taught to look for life in the world and what was happening around me. And so I couldn't understand how a guy who was nailed to a tree could say, my cup runneth over. And when I even asked God about that, I wasn't even trying to get him to explain it to me. I was just telling him, that sounds like nonsense. And you know what I found happened? He brought it forth in me. And now I'm, I'm, I'm talking, not theoretically, I'm talking by way of having experienced the life that was in Jesus, where he said, my cup runneth over, even though he's nailed to a tree. And I struggle to even want to talk about it because people think you're crazy. People message me all the time and ask me questions about all these things, and I try to tell them, I'm not sure you really want what I have. Because I promise you, I didn't want what I have now 10, 15 years ago. And had someone come talking to me about what I have now and tried to explain it to me, I would think they were telling me about how I'm going to die and how I'm never going to enjoy anything in the world and how, que sera, que sera. That's how I would have interpreted Greg today, Greg, 15 years ago. But all I can say is, no, I've actually found real life now. (laughs) And it ain't been by my doing. It's only been because God actually persuaded me that faith is talking about Jesus. And when I just heard that faith was talking about Jesus, I stopped thinking about my ability to believe in my belief, and I found that my heart started naturally gravitating towards Jesus and what happened there and what God did in Jesus. And what I found was, is that was like a mustard seed that even though it looked small, it branched out into my heart like the biggest tree in the whole world. Thank you, Jesus. So walking by sight, walking by sight is to look to the world and its systems to see if you have what is needed for a righteous life or not. 
That's walking by sight. Walking by sight is to look to the world and its systems to see if you have what is needed for a righteous life. That's what it means to walk by sight. Walking by faith and not by sight means to live the life you have in this world all the time beholding the bite of the serpent nailed to the pole. You know what the bite of the serpent is? Death, corruption, tribulation, decay, violence, injustice. Walking by faith and not by sight is to live the life you have in this world all the time beholding those things nailed to the pole just like Moses nailed the serpent to the pole in Numbers. That's what it means to walk by faith and not by sight. You see the death in the world nailed to the pole instead of looking at the corruption in the world and thinking it's a stumbling block to you having a righteous life. You see the corruption in the world when the world comes and says, this corruption is in the way of you having a righteous life. To walk by faith and not by sight is to see that corruption nailed to the pole. Instead of seeing that corruption as being a stumbling block to you having a righteous life, and as you see the corruption that you think is in the way of you having a righteous life, as you see it nailed to the pole, guess what? Your whole spirit, soul, and body will be healed from the bite of the corruption in the earth. You'll find your heart purified from fear. You'll find your flesh put to rest. And you'll find yourself experiencing the God life. Thank you, Jesus. When we think of things like whether the righteous is reigning or not, I mentioned that at the beginning of the message, when we think about things, whether the righteous are reigning or not, to live by sight is to judge whether the righteous are reigning or not by trying to find evidence in what world leader is reigning. You're living by sight and not by faith. When we think about whether or not the righteous is reigning, we walk by faith and not by sight. We don't look to the world and the world leaders to determine if the righteous are reigning, but we see Jesus and we see that he's the righteous and that he's the just one and that he's reigning now. And the evidence that he's reigning is that he's seated on the right hand of God. That's what it means to walk by faith. You behold it in the man Jesus and it becomes the evidence that everything you long for, everything you hope for, has been realized in Him. And you don't live your life in the world all the time wanting a certain world leader to be president or have a certain government. (laughs) Do you know why? Because you're not beholding your life in the world. You're beholding your life in the resurrected Jesus. And you see, His life is lording it over your life. Meaning that His life is so much that it will even produce the same life in you. And you walk in the world beholding that because that's where the life you want is found. Does that mean I don't have opinions about things that go on in the world? No. You guys really listen to me all these years and think there's anything I don't have an opinion about? (laughs) Ask my wife. (laughs) Ask my wife. (laughs) I'm not telling you scrap your opinions. I'm not telling you not to have an opinion about what you think is right for a worldly nation. But don't confuse that with the source of life or the power unto a righteous life or where your life is hid. Don't confuse those things with that. That's what we don't want. So walking by faith is yes, you are still in this world, but you don't spend your days beholding yourself and your life in the world You spend your days beholding yourself in your life in the face of Jesus. You see Jesus, you see yourself in his face, you see he's in the Father and the Father's in him, so you see that you're in the Father and the Father's in you. You see Jesus and you see the corruption in the world can't decay your life, for your life is no longer made of an earthy substance, but your life has been born from a heavenly substance. And that's what it means to walk by faith and not by sight. It just means behold Jesus. I put the biblical terms in the message because I want people to be able to read the scriptures and understand what the scriptures are trying to say. But the easiest thing you could say when you say you walk by faith and not by sight is to say the life you have, the life that you live in this world now, you live by beholding Jesus. You live by beholding your life in Jesus. 
right? When you think about your life, when you weigh whether or not you have what is needed to have a righteous life, looking unto Jesus, right? The beginning and the end of the life you've always longed for, right? And that will always minister to you peace and calmness and love and joy, right? It will cause your heart to send the sins people have committed against you away from them. It's a whole, listen, when you think someone can sin against you and take life from you, you look at it a whole lot differently than when you think someone can sin against you and it can't take life from you. I promise you. The moment you think someone can take life from you by transgressing you, you're going to be filled with something where you want to whack them back. You see what I'm saying? Right? But the moment you see that their sin against you can't take life from you, neither could them getting it right give life to you, you look at them differently. You find your heart sending transgression away from people organically or effortlessly. Right? In fact, the only reason why our hearts want... I'll just go ahead and say this. The only reason why our hearts want to impute sin to people is because we think what they've done has taken something from us. And let, unless we impute their sin to us, how will our hearts ever protect us from their next transgression? And so a heart persuaded that they have a life that can't be stolen from, that they have a life that can either be added to or subtracted from, doesn't impute sin to people because they don't see that they need to be protected from the people. They see God hath protected them. And then you start being more concerned with the people's lives that committed the sin against you than you're concerned with your own life. Don't think I'm giving you something to produce. With man, it's impossible. With God, all things are possible. Right? Thank you, Father, for bringing the faith that was filled with your life to completion in the man Christ Jesus. Thank you, Father, for pouring out your spirit on all flesh that uh, people could speak of the faith and the life that manifested in Jesus. Thank you, Father, that you, you come and grab the church by the hand, that you hadn't left us to be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine in the earth, but you, you come and you loved us and you come and grabbed us by the hand and you lead us into the place where we see Jesus where we see that Jesus is the substance of everything that we've hoped for, where we find that we're no longer looking to the world for the evidence of whether we have life or not, but that we're looking to the man Jesus at, at, the, at your right hand for the evidence of whether we have life or not. Thank you, Father, that a life of faith is not a life all the time trying to believe to get things to manifest, but that a life of faith is all the time beholding Jesus and beholding yourself and your life in the face of Jesus. Thank you, Father, that even living by faith is easy. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Glory to God. You guys are awesome. I love you guys. Thank you so much.